morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Happy Monday. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend and everything like that. Um, welcome to Citation Week. Today we've got some, or this week we've got some really, really great talks. Uh, tomorrow we've got a well disentanglement and marine animal rescuer, uh, Ricky, stopping by to talk about their work on the front lines of rescuing marine animals here in Baja. Uh, Friday, Hiram, the founder of Emamape is going to uh, join us to talk about their research and conservation projects with cetaceans in Mexico, um, including the work they've been doing with Sea Shepherd trying to defend the vaquita. Um, then we're going to finish up the week on Saturday with a special Dive Ninjas Whale Conservation course. Um, it's a course we designed for our Whale Defender program here in Cabo San Lucas and teaches you kind of about whales, how you can help protect them, um, lots and lots of different information. Uh, the next week, we've got an awesome mixed week coming with uh, talks from everything about the, or all sorts of topics from Mesoamerican coral reef, mobula rays. Um, we even have a special guest talk from Project Aware's community conservation officer, Jack Fishman, who's coming in. Um, but today, we've got a really special guest, Ted Chisholm, the founder of Happy Whale, is joining us. Um, the Happy Whale platform is an incredible project. It is a shining example of the amazing work that citizen science projects can do around the world. Um, it's a program we work with here at Dive Ninjas. We utilize it and everything like that for our whale watching tours and expeditions in Baja. Um, but so without further ado, how are you doing today, Ted? Pretty good, man. Great to see you. Thanks. Awesome. Great to have you. So let me, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can hand it over to you and get ready to rock and roll. Okay. Lovely. Let's see. I think I'm supposed to share my screen now. Uh, see if we can get this going. Um, oh, shoot. And now I don't see the option. Sorry. Should be on the bottom of the screen if you move. Yeah, I, I um, oh, there we go. Cool. Okay. It likes to disappear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, live, live. So look, I, um, I, given, that, um, given that I hear this is the first of the series talk about cetaceans, I thought I would throw in a little bit of why, where the love comes from for me, because, uh, um, oh, that's not what I want. Because, um, uh, yeah, so my experience, I mean, uh, my history is I used to get horribly seasick. I'd go out whale watching because my father was a biologist, my mother was a naturalist. I'd go out whale watching, I'd get sick, I'd take some medicine, I'd sleep through the rest of the boat trip, that was about it. But somehow, something kept me going back to the ocean and eventually, I overcame the seasickness, and this has become my life and my job. And uh, this is like another day at the office for me, absurdly enough. So um, the event here this last February, I was guiding down in Antarctica. It was a whale science tour. Footage, um, and we're out on the water, and this humpback whale just literally whale. comes right up to the boat. So, what I love about this is that you hear like the boat is silent, right? Our engine is off. Nobody is saying a word in the boat because we're all just so speechless. And here the whale's actually like pushing the snuggle up against us. And then off he goes, or she, I don't know. And I got nervous right there because as that whale dove, I know this tail, you know, this tail is this thing that weighs go, two tons and could easily just take out our boat. But the whale kind of truncated its dive. You know, they're super aware, super knowledgeable about their space, um, where we are relative to it. And, um, and it really kind of highlights like what, yeah, this, the, the experience of these whales is just so massive. So I thought I'd kind of share a few stories about it, but, and then, and then kind of get into the heart of what we're doing with Happy Whale and, uh, and, and how it's very much a public participation, citizen science research collaboration entity. Um, so Happy Whale, it, it, it came about actually for me because over the last 25 years, I've been guiding in Antarctica um, and around the world, but with a particular focus on the Antarctic. And going back a century, whaling started in Antarctica a little over 100 years ago, about 110 years ago now. And horribly sad story. Basically, all the large whales were removed, but whaling stopped. And there were just enough whales left that they began to recover. And so in the course of the 25 years that I've been going south, 
we've seen a dramatic recovery. Like we literally would use, we used to just see, you know, we'd see like one good whale watching experience during a month long cruise, 25 day cruise, expedition tourism to the island of South Georgia, to the Antarctic Peninsula. Maybe we'd see, we'd see, you know, one or two events. We'd see a number of whales at a distance, but up close and personal, very few. Until now, where something like that, I mean, I can't guarantee a whale is going to snuggle up to our zodiac, but I can guarantee that we will see an abundance of whales. It's just, it's going to happen. And, uh, and yet, um, and yet we didn't have a lot of access to the science behind this, like not a lot of stories to, to understand what was going on with this whale recovery and so on. And at the same time, we're out there photographing this whales, observing the whales, and there's just not a lot of scientists down there because it's so expensive to get there. It's expensive to run a boat in Antarctica. So um, the notion there was like, hey, could we build a bridge between what essentially data we're collecting every time we photograph a whale to what scientists need and in the other direction, get information from the researchers uh, to this end. And that's, that's really where Happy Whale began. We've now, to this date, we've had like over 6,000, I think I, I looked last night, 6,600 uh, photo contributors. And, um, and uh, we've now documented something like 37,000 different individual humpback whales. And when I say documenting individuals, that's really where the magic comes in here, which is you see here the tails of this, this, this uh, sort of fireworks pattern humpback whale. Every single humpback whale has a unique pattern and shape to its tail. Some of them are all black, some of them are all white, but regardless, they are all unique, at least in the trailing edge shape. So this has been known for about, uh, well, gosh, about 50 years now. It was still during the whaling era when some biologists realized like, hey, actually we can recognize these individuals. We're seeing the same whales over and over again. Started photographing the humpbacks and with these photographs started charting like, okay, well, when are these whales showing up? When are they leaving? What's going on? Numbers were pretty slim there because it was still during the whaling era, their numbers we're just brutally pushed down. But what we've done is we've taken these decades of science and out of it, we've built an image recognition algorithm such that, um, such that we, can, we can take these patterns and match them within those 37,000 whales. Okay, which whale is it that you photograph? So I'd love to, I, I, I wanna dive into all aspects of the whale's biology here and uh, love to take questions afterwards as well. Uh, but there's just so much that's really cool about humpbacks. There's a couple drone images. These images were taken under permit. Um, but, uh, you know, just really fascinating biology. Here you can see they're actually blowing bubble nets to concentrate uh, food. And uh, coming up, you've got the whale. I don't know if you can see my cursor. This whale is coming up with its mouth open. Another coming up with its mouth open. There's a third whale below there, social bubble netting such that they come up all together. And there's actually a fourth whale right in there to capture food together more than they could do so separately. So there's all these aspects of whale biology. I could dive into it and talk at length, but I'm gonna focus here on this individuality aspect of it and the way that, um, you know, that, uh, that the public can contribute. Um, Cause I think, I think it's, I think it's pretty special and, um, and, uh, and, and pretty fun as well. Um, this is kind of an extreme of a whale that's really, really indistinct, an all black fluke, not necessarily the best photographs. Um, all white fluke here in the, this case is from Oceania, from New Caledonia. And then more pattern flukes. What we do is, well, we built what is essentially a little bit like a black box. We, we have a set of known whales, 37,000 of them in, with I think at this point over 60,000 photographs, so multiple photographs of many of the whales. And anytime somebody sends us an image, happywell.com, and you hit submit uh, photos and you know just upload whatever image of, of a whale taken while out uh, whale watching. And uh, we will match 
the, the, the photos to our known whales. And if we don't know the whale, which certainly happens quite a lot um, in a place like Cabo, I think we're getting so that we know about 50% of the whales. Coastal California, we know 70, 80, 90% of the whales. I, um, and then and there's some areas like inside passages, Southeast Alaska, we know almost 100% of the whales. Um, some other areas like South Africa, for example, we know just a few percent of the whales. So, but um, pretty good matching. Here is a case of like, this is actually a baby whale that was seen in coastal California. And then a, a couple years later, that whale as a, as a young adult was given a different ID and a different name then eventually we ran it through this algorithm that we only developed last year and found out, hey, that's the same whale. Um, so, you know, and emerged it. And, and what we've done in a lot of cases is we've taken, we work with a lot of research collaborators. Um, and in many cases, we're taking databases that are decades old and finding like, oh, hey, you have, in this case, it was five different whales. Uh, with five different numbers found out, hey, they're all, all the same individual. So um, yeah, lots of examples. But what's really fun about this to me is that we're able to do this in mass so that when, uh, for example, this last January, um, there was a BBC and PBS program called The Whale Detective that, uh, that featured this, um, that talked about what we're doing a little bit. And so we got this flood of new images and uh, it was all good. It was a lot of fun. We literally just get thousands of images and we can match, you know, every single one. And so the product of that then is it's not just like, okay, thanks for your image, but it's, hey, here's the story of your whale, um, which I think is a lot of fun because, you know, say you submit an image and we don't know who your whale is but maybe six months later, somebody photographs that whale in another, you know, these are migratory animals. This is a case of a long migration individual. Most of the whales over here on the bottom of the screen here, you've got the Antarctic Peninsula. Most whales from the Antarctic Peninsula go up the coast of South America and they breed in Ecuador or Colombia or Panama. But this one actually went far Northwest out to Tonga um, a, uh, a migration that in one direction is 5,500 miles, almost 9,000 kilometers. And so the person who photographed it in Antarctica got an email saying, hey, you know, we, we matched your whale to, and then the person that photographed it up in, uh, in Tonga got an email as well saying, hey, we've matched your whale and look at this long migration. Um, in some cases, it's, you know, just a few months later, uh, in this one case, um, I, this was actually my photograph up in Franz Josef land, up in the high Arctic, um, an area that if you look at a map of humpback whale, um, humpback whale distribution, this is off the north end of the charts. 30 years later, uh, photographed this whale that uh, was previously seen back in 1982 down in, the, in, in, uh, in Panama. I'm sorry, in Panama, in the Caribbean. Um, whoops, not sure what happened there. Um, don't know what's going on with the screen. Make this go away. Um, huh. Well, no worries. Um, Cabo is a central point. What's, what's really cool about Cabo is that uh, Whales traveling through Cabo disperse to all parts. I should uh, have, a, have a little map here of where the whales go, but some from Cabo actually interchange with Hawaii. Some go as far northwest as Russia. Um, some go up to Southeast Alaska, Southern Alaska, British Columbia, down in California. This is actually one whale here that, um, that um, I'm not sure, I'm gonna stop the screen share and start it again. I'm not sure why it's doing. I think actually the problem is with PowerPoint. Um, um, try that. Try starting that again. Um, sorry about this. I don't know. Well, whatever. Never mind that. Um, yeah, moving on. Um, kind of to me, though, I think one of the really important things about this is the power of the story of individuals. And this is a sad story, but I tell it all the same because 
this is a whale, you know, the, it's the oceans, it's easy for the whales to be out of sight and out of mind. And, and when they are, you know, we don't, we don't connect with that. I mean, to me, it's like, I care about whales a lot, but it's a lot easier to care about an individual when I know them, much in the same way that like, I care that dogs are, and I care about animals, but you know, and I, I'm against uh, any kind of violence against animals, but boy, if you're talking about my dog, like I am going to protect my dog who is sitting here very conveniently being quiet as long as there's no squirrels outside the door. And here's a case of a whale. This whale was named Scarlet because in the course of this entanglement, Scarlet got caught up in uh, some fishing lines, some crab pot lines. And uh, in the course of the entanglement, she got just covered in barnacles and, uh, and, and or rather um, um, cyamid lice uh, because she was super unhealthy but literally hundreds and hundreds of people saw her in this condition. And we were able to connect back to the story. She was a whale known since the 90s. She'd been seen with calves, which made it kind of a more powerful and a deeper story. Another case of an entangled whale. This is, uh, this is um, uh, 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 a blue whale, which we mostly don't track blue whales, but in the case of any individual, we're happy to make those uh, make those connections. This is a blue whale that was known as Cadillac because of those wingtip tails. Well, Cadillac was last seen entangled, and I could very well see it. People put a lot more effort into trying to find her, hopefully to disentangle her because of knowing her as an individual. Um, it really it brings the oceans closer. So what we're trying to do is take this mass of data this just insane numbers. I mean, this is a little, it's a bit old actually. We have a lot more data than this now, but a screenshot of the distribution of, of, of whale images um, and uh, marine mammal images around the world. And you can see here, you know, we have a concentration in the Pacific, a really, really high representation, but also Antarctica. Um, trying to make it more personal, more accessible, and also more available for the science. So it's kind of been a lot of fun making a bit of a global community down here on the left. This is our most sighted whale, uh, one of our few most sighted whales. So this is a whale known as Fran. Um, and, uh, and you can see like every single one of these, you know, something like 50 different photographers have, have photographed Fran 116 times in the Monterey Bay area, seen down in Cabo, seen down in the, the coastal Mexico where the whales breed. So I love that social aspect of it. It's a little bit like uh, whale social media, um, but uh, you know, turning something into, you know, this for me was a really special one. I photographed this whale and then found out that Ken Balcom, who's kind of a personal hero, one of the early whale scientists who really just pushed into conservation. He's now working hard on protecting uh, the, um, the killer whales of, of, of the Salish Sea around Washington and British Columbia. Um, you know, to have photographed the same whale as one of my personal heroes, like that's just pretty cool to me. So uh, linking things up. And so in Monterey Bay, which is right seven blocks away from me, uh, I live up in Santa Cruz, which is at the north end of this little map. We're using this to understand the distribution of whales and relating that to the distribution of crab fisheries, right? So how can we hopefully make a situation where the two can coexist well together? So I think I'm kind of getting towards the end of my time here, but, um, but um, it's not just humpback whales. We've actually have quite a collection of killer whales. There's lots of different marine mammal species are individually identifiable. Um, this is a little piece of literature put together by uh, the Australian Antarctic uh, program, looking at different ways that animals can be photo identified. Fin, oops, don't know why that happened. Fin whales um, and uh, minke whales and such, say whales by their dorsal fins and the patterns on the flanks. Killer whales, again, by the patterns. We also use this to assess health, like uh, various kinds of scarring or ship strikes. Um, and so the net of it is basically turning those really cool and beautiful patterns into something, you know, accessible and, uh, and, and really making science our superpower. So 
I like to, you know, throw a whale in there and, um, and, and I'll, uh, I'll end it there and uh, just, um, yeah, happy to take any questions and chat about whales. It's definitely a, my favorite topic. Awesome, man. Thank you very much. It was an incredible presentation. Really great. And it's great to see you and the ones from Cabo and everything. To see them here, but seeing where they're going and all this is just it's incredible. Really, really, really cool. Thank you for that. Um, so, guys, if you have any questions or anything like that, you can throw them in the Q&A box. Um, click on the little Q&A button and type the questions in. We'll read them out to Ted online. Um, or feel free to throw anything into the chat and everything like that. Um, and we'll uh, go from there. Let's see what we got. All right, starting to pop in. Cool. So Sue A asks, um, I was told that humpback whale populations from the northern and southern hem hemisphere are completely distinct and never mingle. Is that true and supported by the data you guys have collected? Uh, mostly so. Actually, let me give me a second here. I'm going to bring up um, a little map of like the global humpback whale uh, it's like literally every humpback whale sighting we have with all the connectivity and all as soon as it's a big data search here but uh doing it live um so basically there's one exception well there's a couple exceptions northern and southern hemisphere pretty much the equator is a pretty hard line um there's two places where humpbacks appear to cross the equator on a regular basis one is in uh in going from Antarctica up to their breeding grounds. So um, let's see here. Um, this is, I'm gonna screen share again. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, so, uh, so, whoa, whoops, sorry. Just kind of disappeared on me. There we go. Okay, this is a little bit messy, but it's literally, 57,000 encounters and then all the uh, the the arrows the lines are the lines in between um, individuals that have uh, have um, where they've been seen in two different destinations so right here um, in around Central America the Antarctic whales will actually come north uh, of the equator but what's kind of wild about that is that um, well, they come north of the equator because when they go to their breeding grounds, they're looking for a specific, pretty narrow range of water temperatures to breed in. So coastal South America has Antarctic water that's coming up, the Humboldt Current, so it makes it quite cold. So these whales actually have to go further north to get to warmer water. So they go past the equator and up to Ecuador, Colombia, and uh, Panama to breed, and even in the even they'll come up as far as um, Costa Rica and southern Nicaragua. We recently co-authored a paper about the furthest north migration of an Antarctic whale ever found, and that was into southern Nicaragua. Northern hemisphere whales do come down here, and they actually overlap in space, <clears throat> but they don't appear to overlap in time. And they don't appear to genetically, you know, intermingle. It's uh, there's there's a geneticist Scott Baker who I heard him say off the cuff. He said, "Well, they maybe probably interbreed once a generation, so pretty darn separated." I said there were two exceptions, and then the other one, the other exception, is in the Indian Ocean where you have a really unique situation there because you've got um, you've got a um, a closed. Uh, a, an ocean that's close to the north, right? So you've got whales that are in the, humpback whales that are in the North Indian Ocean that cross the equator, but those whales do not appear to interbreed with the Southern Indian Ocean humpback whales. So for whatever reason, there's kind of a hard stop there. You know, they have tails and they know how to use them. That's not to say they never would. And obviously, they, if it's one species globally, right, there's no question that there's different species of humpback whales. So, you know, they, they certainly could, but behaviorally, they appear to just not intermingle. Is there any hypothesis on why they don't intermingle or why that barrier exists with the equator? I mean, essentially, it's because they get, go to the first warm water that's accessible. And why they go to that warm water? Well, it's, it was historically, it was sort of like, oh, they must be going to warm water to have a nice, easy place to, for their calves to be born. 
But actually, I think the best hypothesis is, is for, for skin condition, right? Mm -hmm. Stick your hand into ice water and your hand goes numb and guess what? Your skin is not regenerating at that time, right? So when they go into the warmer waters, they're actually able to shed their skin and regenerate and, and essentially like clear their hulls. Like the hull of a ship gets covered in barnacles and it slows down. Same thing happens essentially to the whales and then they shed their skin during the breeding season. So they don't have any reason to go past that. Mm -hmm. And it's not the distance, it's actually the time involved. But like, why would an Antarctic whale go up to the Arctic? Well, they've got all the feeding they need in the Antarctic. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the best explanation, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, it functionally, it's like they go to where they need to go to, uh, to get the, you know, to, to breed and then turn around and go back to the feeding grounds that they know. And clearly, they do have a pretty strong site fidelity. They do tend to go back to the same feeding grounds. Wow. Not 100%, but pretty high. Yeah. That's amazing, really incredible. Awesome, so Emma asks, how does Happy Whale handle unknown whales? Um, do you send those pictures to the research projects that manage the local catalogs or keep an existing catalog of unknowns? So if uh, there's two, there's two possibilities there. One, it's an unknown and it's a pretty bad photograph. And two, it's an unknown, but it's a really good photograph. And, 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 and then there's gray areas in between. Because of this image recognition algorithm, it's, it's, it's just been so enabling, so fantastic. Basically what's happening is, I am looking at the rest of the question is, you know, do we send them to local research projects? Actually, what's happening is a lot of the research projects are sending the images to us and saying, hey, can you catalog these whales? Because we now have thousands of whales we know, and it's just too much work to go through and manually match them all. So the first thing we do is we get, so let's say we get a thousand photographs. We'll identify every single one that we can, and then there'll be a bunch that are unknown. We'll take the the good to high quality ones and we'll say, oh, this is an unknown whale. And because it's a good enough quality, we're confident that it's unknown because we didn't find them because there was no, that, that whale is new to us. So then we'll put a new ID on that whale. And, I'll, and the, then if, if, if it's a poor quality photo, well, maybe there was a match, but we didn't find it. And in those cases, we'll just keep those photos and we'll keep trying to find a match, but we won't put a new ID on it. So basically we're putting new IDs on whales and then we get two catalogs from different researchers and we find, oh, look, here's all these same. We have whales that have like eight different catalog names from different research groups. So yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty fun that way. That's amazing, it's incredible. Awesome. Laurel asks, what's the, what is the largest humpback that's ever been photographed? Ooh, ever photographed? It's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, a part of that is how do you measure a humpback, right? And, uh, and I showed a drone image there. I don't readily have one, but you know, most photographs is really hard to tell size, right? So what I can say is, um, I believe the largest humpback whale ever measured, well, Unfortunately, whaling has a history that makes it easier to measure them. Um, and uh, there was a lot of, well, there's a lot of good science that we can learn a lot from, though I'm very glad that the great majority of whaling is gone. But um, whales, uh, humpback whales seem to be at their absolute biggest about, about 58, 60 feet. I don't remember the exact record, but I think there's a few have been measured a little over 60 feet. Um, the females get bigger, they're about 10% bigger than whales, so, and that's the case for blue whales too. So the biggest animal that's ever existed, you know, anyone that doesn't think that women are, that, that females are powerful, the largest animal that has ever existed was absolutely a female, um, it would, would be a female blue whale. But uh, for humpbacks, um, I, I imagine, I don't know the largest ever photograph, but I'm sure that some have been photographed well in excess of 50 feet, which would be probably 25 tons of whale, um, massive. I mean, 50, 60,000 pounds. The best way to measure a whale in a photograph now is with a drone where you measure the height and then you can do a bit of trigonometry if you know the height, then you can measure out the, the size and dimension of, of the whales. Cool stuff. 
Oh, that's incredible. I didn't know that. So um, that's good to know, like for us, because we fly, I fly a lot of drones with the whales and everything yeah. like that here in Baja. Um, so if we record what height we've taken the photo at with the drone, you can essentially figure out the, the length, basically, if we add that to our data range. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, it, it, it'd be worthwhile to look into a little bit of, um, you know, photogrammetry, because uh, there's a lot of techniques being established now. And I think usually um, what, you know, the best situation is where you have a laser range finder, right? Because normally, like if you just use altitude, that's too, you don't have enough, that, that, that doesn't have enough resolution, you know, 10 feet matters a lot and your yeah. drone's not going to be able to nail it uh, there. But uh, yeah, it'd be something I'd be psyched to talk about because there's a lot of good uh, projects looking at, you know, the same whale over time to see how much weight are they gaining? How much weight are they losing in the course of, you know, these whales, okay, so they go from the feeding areas at high latitudes, right? They're eating, 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 eating. And then the female, she's growing a calf. She leaves the feeding area. She goes to the breeding area. She's not going to eat for four, five, six months. Not eating, giving birth to a calf, nursing that calf. We're talking about, you know, 100 gallons of milk a day, like 800 pounds, 400, 300 to 400 kilograms of milk. And that milk is not, it's not, you know, human milk is what, 10 or 15% uh, uh, milk solids, of, you know, fat. Their milk is like 55 to 60% fat. I mean, this is, we're talking about like cream. Yeah. Delivering so much energy such that that baby can literally be putting on 100 pounds a day, then swim back to the feeding grounds, right? So the, the amount of energy gained in the feeding season, lost in the in the in the winter in the breeding season, it's just astounding. It's really amazing that you know they evolved to make this work. And yeah, well, it's really mind blowing. Well. It is really yeah. they are incredible creatures. Unbelievable. Yeah. So Victoria says, thank you for the information, and it is amazing and inspiring to see how you are so motivated and happy about this great monitoring. Um, so each whale is totally individually identifiable. Their tails are basically like our fingerprints. Um, each pattern is really unique. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. We literally, um, we, okay, so when we do the automated image recognition, we let the computer find the match and it'll, it'll give a score of match confidence, but we manually, with human eyes, we confirm every single match, right? But what happens all the time is that we look at the two and we're like, no, that's not a match. And then, but, but then you look at the score and you're going like, wait, that's a, that's a pretty high score. And then you start looking a little deeper and you go, oh, oh, actually that, that is a match. Um, so, uh, so I was um, just uh, share my screen again for, for, for an example, just cause I think it's so darn cool. Um, here we go. Uh, here's an example of, you know, so the least, uh, least patterned whales are these all black ones, these all white ones. But you see, even there, the edge is unique. And now this will change over time. Oops. Um, so like, here's a case where it's a pretty poor quality photo at the bottom. And that's this whale is like either a calf or a juvenile. But, um, and then its pattern got a lot more distinct. But the, the photograph on top there is probably the whale of at least three years old. Um, and it'll maintain that pattern for the rest of its life. You know, certainly things can happen. Uh, ship strike or an entanglement, part of the fluke gets chopped off. Um, here again, you know, the calf on the right, you see barnacles there. Well, those barnacles resulted in the scars that you see on the left there. You know, this you know, one, two, three, you see those same one, two, three scars. And those scars will actually grow with the whale. Um, I, I was hoping, uh, I was hoping I had an example of killer whale scars here, but I, I don't. So, you know, there you go. But yeah, super unique. Um, it's not, some are not obvious. Some are super obvious. Awesome. Really cool. So Jose Larroza, he says, thanks, Ted, for this important talk. This data is useful for uh, reducing ship strikes in the deep ocean areas. Have countries and major shipping companies been receptive to altering potential shipping routes to help reduce strikes? Yeah, that's one of the great success stories. I'm personally, I'm, I'm going to, 
first point to one that I was involved in, which is that um, in Antarctica, as of this past January, um, there was a ship slowdown zone, uh, basically a 2,000 square kilometer area that encompasses the majority of the area that uh, Antarctic tourism is at its uh, highest concentration. We, we, as in all the Antarctic tour operators agreed, we will operate at a maximum of 10 knots in this area during the whale season from January 1st onward. Um, and why to reduce the risk to the whales, right? So another, and this is, this is basically was a bit of learning from other successful examples. One of the best cases here is the North Atlantic right whales, extremely endangered. And they were getting hit by ships around Boston. They live in Stellwagen Bank, which is just off of Boston Harbor. Well, looking at data of where the whales were, and where the shipping traffic went. They rerouted shipping traffic a little bit. It definitely has a cost, right? Because you're adding distance to shipping traffic, but um, reduced speeds and rerouted and uh, dramatically reduced um, shipping, uh, ship strikes there. It's not ever going to be easy, but it certainly is, you know, this is part of it is getting it, making it not out of sight, out of mind. Part of it is making it, you know, aware and then a part of it is having the data for sure and so you know and so the role of the citizen scientists here is like if you put a gps on your camera well it's awesome to know okay you were in you know you went whale watching out of san francisco but if we know exactly where you were relative to you know relative to the shipping lanes in san francisco that's a critical area where we've got whales that have recently moved into regularly going under the Golden Gate Bridge. Like whenever I've been whale watching there and it's, it's like, it's terrifying. And you got these whales, they're feeding and then, you know, a 50,000 ton cargo vessel comes on by. It's just like, oh my God, it's like, you know, the whales are feeding on a freeway, right? But, um, but so, you know, awareness and good data. These are, these are, really the the strongest tools we have in our toolkit yeah it's amazing it's really cool it's amazing that they actually made change for it and everything yeah there's a lot there's a lot to do there's a lot to do i actually a buddy just pinged me the other day he says like man south africa we really need to have some kind of slowdown regime uh because you know it, there it's like eh, we don't know yeah exactly that's incredible so uh, Sri Lanka says, I'm really interested in whales and my ambition is to be a marine biologist. Could you refer any books to, uh, to read regarding whales? Mm, books to read regarding whales. Well, my favorite book, um, I don't know, it's, it's not so much story. I was, was going to reach for my copy of it, but it's not within reach. But um, um, Mark Cowardine's field guide to uh, whales and dolphins. I don't know, it's not the exact name, but Mark Cowardine is, is the author. Just recently issued, put out a new, um, a new, uh, a new edition of uh, this whale and dolphin guide. I mean, that's not so much an intro to how to become a marine biologist, but it's really fantastic information. Um, one thing I'd say for the aspiring marine biologist, maybe a different thing, um, is there's a, there's a, um, there's a web, a, um, uh, what do you call it, a listserv called Marmam, M-A-R-M-A-M, and it's really good to, you know, jump on there, um, people announce, hey, I've just published this paper, and so you get to see, like, one, who's publishing what, and, you know, the best advice I got as I was approaching this was, Find the people that do the work that is inspiring. Read everything they've written and then, you know, and, and keep going from there. Look at the references. Read the original source literature. Not so much books because, I mean, books can be great, but oftentimes they're, you know, a few years older. Reading the source literature for the biologist is, is pretty key. So Marmam is a neat way to basically see who's doing what and, uh, and, and get into it. Yeah, awesome. You got the link. Well done. I'll pull them up for you. I'm sending just so everyone knows. We just sent the link as well as the name of the book uh, you mentioned into the yeah. chat. So if anyone cool. wants to grab it and check it out there. Great. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And be so, persistent. That's the yeah. other thing. It's not an easy field. <laughs> <laughs> 
Awesome. So Christine says, I'm so glad I got to hear about Happy Whale. I'm a whale lover since the first time I have had an encounter with them. Um, I've actually sent in my first pictures a little while ago from a photograph in Combo. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing if anyone else has spotted them. Um, so if you get information on a whale that is injured or entangled, what is the protocol that you take and how, what can we do to help? Oh, interesting. If you see an active entanglement, this is actually like there, most areas have some kind of entanglement network. So if you are out on a boat and you see an active entanglement, um, there's, there's, there's actually a protocol. First off, you know, if you're considering going out among whales, it's great to get to know what's going on, find out, you know, uh, find out about the entanglement network in Car Cabo. Um, oh my gosh, this is yeah, horrible. Robin. I've just blanked on the, the, the name of the entanglement. Robin, Robin yes, they, yeah, which has the cool, one of my, my favorite whale logos that I've ever seen. It's mm -hmm. just this really cool logo of like, you know, somebody lifting a net off of the tail of a whale. Um, but, um, but knowing about the entanglement network, having the number handy so that you can get on your cell phone there, hopefully, and, and say, Hey, we have an active entanglement and follow. Usually if you can, if you can, they will ask you to stay with the whale, just watch it, photograph it. Don't, you know, don't drive up on it. And then hopefully there can be an, uh, a response mounted. Unfortunately, the reality is that most entanglements do not end up in a successful intervention. Um, entanglements and ship strikes are the two biggest threats, direct threats to whales today. There's certainly lots of others, ocean health, fisheries, climate change, big deals, but entanglements and ship strikes, these are the direct ones that, I mean, you have got, um, you know, the talk on Bakitas later on in the series. Um, I mean, it's, tra it's just, uh, it's just, my heart bleeds for the species that is going extinct because of entanglement and it's yeah um but if you see a scarred whale we really like to see photographs of it so like the ideal for us is okay great we have a fluke to photograph or to identify the whale but then body condition images images of that scar and such and knowing that that's you know these photographs go with that fluke that's that's pretty key and um there's been various studies looking at scarring rates they're stunningly high it's amazing how you know in in, in many regions it's above 50 percent of the whales actually have entanglement scarring um and uh oftentimes we can look through the history of the archives and see when did that scar happen um sometimes even by circumstance tell where it happened and such so yeah it makes a really meaningful uh body of data yeah for sure absolutely incredible and that's like that's for for those that are tuning in too tomorrow ricky that's joining us is part of robin he's one of the yeah. whale disentanglement nice. Um, nice, nice, nice. uh rescuers here working in uh mexico um he used he actually trained in the u.s with noah with those guys and everything like that up there for a while and used to work with noah in the u.s and then came back to mexico and worked and helped build the program and uh, worked nice. with the program here and everything so. Yeah, Robin's a good crew of people and all it's just heroes work and I, I think they also have a really good perspective, which is the disentanglement is really important, but understanding the problem. I mean, honestly, if we can get to 1% of the entangled whales, that is like, it, it's tough. But yeah. if we can understand the issue such that we can, you know, not stop the fisheries, but actually help the fisheries work in concert. I mean, here in California, We've, um, we've actually stopped the crab fishery. Uh, let's see, when is it closing? I think it's closing right about now, closing early to reduce the risk to whales. But ultimately what we need to do is, you know, design traps that are less prone to entangling the whales. But again, awareness, awareness and good data. That's really what the, the, the tools that we've got and we got to use them. Really, really. All right, awesome. So Chloe asks, uh, knowing cetaceans are pretty social creatures, have you observed different species of whales who inhabit the same waters interacting with each other? Yes. Um, uh, let's see. First, first interaction that comes to mind was, uh, let's see, about a year ago, um, we came upon some killer whales in Antarctica that we believe they were, they were finishing up a kill. We believe it had been an elephant seal, but by the time we got there, it was parts. Um, and there was a mother and calf humpback whale that literally were just like 
cruising in. And it was funny because it was like they were just really curious. Um, I mean, in general, you don't see a lot of interspecies intermingling. We've totally seen like blue whales actually up in the Gulf. You can see like blue whales get super annoyed by dolphins. They're just like, get away. You know, it's, I mean, this is, this is a generalization. You know, they're individuals, they have different reactions. I've seen beautiful photos of dolphins literally bow riding on whales, right? But, um, but one of the most in intense and interesting interactions that we get is here, right about now, actually, now it's kind of trailing off, but in April, the gray whales are migrating north from, from breeding in coastal Baja. So they have their young calves, killer whales. There's a certain pod of killer whales that has a fondness for feeding on them. And they like to come to Monterey because what happens is in Monterey, a lot of the mothers will choose to go straight across the bay rather than hug the coastline. When they're close to the coast, they're much less prone to predation by killer whales, but that adds about 20 miles to their journey. They haven't eaten for months. They're hungry. They want to get to Alaska to feed. So they'll sometimes go straight across the bay and then they're traveling over deep water. Killer whales will come in and attack the calves. What we've seen here is that humpbacks for some reason have this particular, like they have it out for the killer whales. So they will come in and try to interrupt the kill, even though they're not at all threatened by the killer whales, which is right, this really interesting three-way interaction. And uh, it's become, it didn't happen this year because of COVID, but uh, so I actually didn't even hear about any killer whale attacks here. I mean, there were some boats still going out, but uh, you know, not, not with passengers, but just the owners going out. But usually around now we, we document, you know, half a dozen to, a, to say maybe 10 or 12 killer whale attacks on gray whales. And usually in two or three of them, humpbacks will come in and, and in, insert themselves. Sometimes they're too late. Uh, I think there's been cases where they did actually, you know, it was, it was observed that they were able to uh, stop the kill. I, I it's kind of just intense stuff, really. I mean, can you imagine you know, 20 tons of whale charging in and being like, no, stop, I'm not going to let you kill this baby. Yeah, force to be reckoned with. It's incredible. I remember seeing a documentary about that, um, but it wasn't in California. I don't remember what location it was. It's an older, I think it was BBC, if I remember a while, like an older video from maybe the 80s or something like that, where there was a, a mother and calf gray whale and the uh, orcas were trying to separate them and, you know, split them up and everything to predate the, the calf. And then essentially as they got them apart and right when you would expect like the worst to happen um these massive male humpbacks come in and just start launching like smashing their wow. tails into the water in front wow. of the orcas and just like pushing them back out of the way and everything and stayed with the calf until the orcas like left the area um wow. and, like, well, basically decided this is too much too difficult or whatever it's incredible yeah. story really, yeah really incredible story yeah Pretty intense, you know, and all this is going on out there and, you know, it's, it's tough to get out there and see it, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's tremendous. I see. So Enrique says, uh, hi Ted, nice talk, thank you very much. Um, humpback whales normally visit the coast of Ecuador from June or July to September. When we navigate about six miles off to a small rocky island to scuba dive, we normally see them on the way. Um, and every now and then they come close and we can hear them singing, even mothers and calves communicating. Yeah. Unfortunately, this area is used also for fishing. So there are sometimes a lot of gill nets uh, set around. Yeah. How savvy are whales to avoid this kind of fishing gear? Can they easily spot them? I can't, I can't see it. No, unfortunately. So gill nets, um, are, are, are probably a bigger danger to smaller cetaceans more than they are to the large Whales. I mean, it, it depends on the gill net, right? If it's a if it's a more of an artisanal gill net, like the you know small boat or hand deployed, um, it's probably not going to kill the whale. It could injure them potentially. What is a real danger to the great whales is um, is uh, is pot fisheries, crab, lobster, because basically then you have virtually unbreakable rope and then a weight at the end of it, right? So we've literally had whales, and, and it happens like every year, whales will show up in Hawaii towing snow crab pots, thousand pound, you know, 300, 400, 500 
pound pots at the end of a line. Can you imagine what that feels like? It literally will cut off limbs. Not as much of an issue in the Southern Hemisphere. I don't know if that's just like because of physical separation of where pot fishing is and where the whales are, are where certainly most whales that we're seeing, the biggest populations are in the Antarctic and there's no pot fishing there. The gill nets, um, yeah, no, the whales cannot see them. Um, and they also don't differentiate. I mean, even lines, like there's been efforts to make, you know, very visible lines, but these are whales, like they like to play in kelp, you know, they like to roll around and stuff. And so the idea of a polypropylene, basically unbreakable line, or, you know, they, especially the, the virtually invisible gill net, you know, they'll, they'll swim right into it. And, um, you know, I mean, the good thing is that they're incredibly enduring, right? They can go for months and months and months without feeding. So usually it seems like based on the scarring rate, it seems like usually they will get free. But, you know, this is not just a population issue. In some cases, entanglement seems to be enough to really change, you know, population development. I mean, imagine the animal welfare issue. Like, what a horrible way to die, to be wrapped up in a net or, you know, tied up in a line for months on end, starving over it. So I don't want to belabor the, the kind of brutal aspects of it. But yeah, no, I think, um, I think the danger is real. Um, the danger is certainly well documented to smaller cetaceans, dolphins, uh, and certainly seals get, you know, get drowned all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So Eduardo asks, where do you think is the best place in the world to take pictures of humpbacks underwater? Ooh, I heard underwater. that Babau Tonga could be the best in October, or do you have any other recommendations? Uh, so to my knowledge, there's basically three places in the world where, um, where swimming with or being in the water with humpbacks is kind of well developed. Um, and that's Tonga, uh, the Silver Bank of the Dominican Republic and um, and in Australia, a relatively new program in Australia. Um, there's certainly other nations that have uh, you know that that have in water operations, Nui and uh, various pl places like that. Numbers are less, but uh, sometimes also the numbers of boats out there are less. Tonga is probably the most well known. Um, it's my problem with Tonga is that it's, I think it's a very easy to get into a situation where boats are competing, you know, so you actually end up harassing the whales. Um, and depending on who you talk to, there was actually some pretty good science done in the last couple of years showing that there is actually a real impact for it. So for me, the best place, for me personally, I think the best place is wherever you are making sure that you're with a really responsible operator that has protocol for how to do responsible in-water operation and follows it. It's not good enough just to have the protocol. You got to follow it too. I like the Silver Bank of the Dominican Republic because there's only three boats that go out there and they're one week trips. Yeah, that means they're fairly expensive, but, um, but, uh, um, uh, but the reality is because there's only three boats and there's hundreds of whales, you know, you're well outnumbered by the whales and consequently, you know, there's not a pressure. Oh, we got to get in with this whale. You know, it's like, oh, well, if this whale isn't into us, cool. Let's let the whales come to us. And, uh, and more or less, you know, taking your time and working with the whale and, you know, making sure the whale is comfortable with the operation. Tonga has really, really clear water, which is a lot, one thing a lot of people really love about it. But to me, first things first, making sure that the whale is comfortable with you. Is, you know, the responsible operation is, I think, a really important thing. No. And I think that in places like that, like Bangladesh, and these places that you have, you know, tons of operators out there and everything, because it's become so famous over the years and everything like that, it's really important looking for the operators that actually do, you know, follow regulations and take care of the whales and actually respect them, you know, yep. I mean, whereas instead of uh, just going for, you know, whatever you can find or the cheapest option or whatever yeah. it might be. I think that's really critical. I do too. And I, I guess I want to, I want to add to this for all parts of this, whether it's photographing the whale for, um, for, you know, for the fluke, for the ID, for a beautiful photograph, 
following responsible whale watching guidelines is, you know, whale watching can be a really powerful por force for conservation and it can be a major problem, you know, and, and, and it's up to us as individuals to decide which it is, you know, if, I mean, I, I run nature tours with one hat and I'm a whale scientist with another hat and I like to mix the two quite a lot. And, uh, you know, but uh, for every traveler, you know, choosing, there's a group called the World Cetacean Alliance and I strongly encourage checking out, you know, is, is you know, are they a World Cetacean Alliance member? Cool, good, that's, you know, that, that doesn't mean that World Cetacean Alliance members do everything perfectly and nobody who isn't a member is responsible, no, you know, but, but that's, a good, that's a good place to start betting. And, uh, and it really makes a huge difference. Never, ever, ever use, oh, I just wanted to get the photograph as an excuse for doing something that, you know, I just if, if, if you're there because you love the animal, love it, love the animal by respecting it first. So, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we always say with school, like when we teach uh, photography courses and everything like that, the first rule of underwater photography or any kind of wildlife photography is the camera is not a uh, pass to break the rules or to harass animals or anything like that. Love it. Yeah, that's great. That's really important because, and this is the part of it where self-interest comes into it. If you let the animal have natural behavior, maybe you don't get as close to every animal, but the one animal that, that is like, oh, that's cool. You know, that, 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 that humpback whale that snuggled up to our zodiac, it approached us from like 100 feet away, right? The interactions are so profound. And you're not just taking a picture of the tail of the animal running away, but they're coming towards you going, hey, you're curious. I want to check you out. You know, that's, exactly. that's special. To me, that's, that's the love. Yeah, you know? that's yeah. it, without yeah. a doubt. Awesome. So Faye says, great talk. Thanks. Do we know how long humpback whales live? And can you get a sense of their age when photographing them? I'm wondering if you have seen uh, some golden oldies. Oh, for sure. Um, okay. So how long do they live? Um, I think that it'd be reasonable to say that humpback whales have about, they have a lifespan pretty close to us pre-Western medicine, right? Pre, you know, so a lot die young, a lot die in the first, you know, calf, first year, second year, but if they make it past that, um, you're probably going to get whales that, you know, they're gonna live 20, 25 years, 30 years. Once, you know, whales that we have photographs where we know, you know, okay, so oftentimes the first, we have no idea, well, sorry, Sometimes we know, oh, clearly that's a calf, right? It's with mom or it's very distinctly, you know, sort of a juvenile's kind of tail. Maybe it's a year old or whatever. But oftentimes we don't know how old that first photograph is. The photograph that same well 20 years later, you start to see like gnarled tails and more accumulation of scars and stuff. Um, we do have whales that were first photographed in the 70s. So, you know, that's in excess of 40 years. If I go to, um, so we have this little, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll use this excuse to uh, do a little, another screen share. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have this little tab in Happy Whale stats right here. And so if you go to individuals, you can see um, longest time between first and last sightings, 42 years, right? So, I mean, it's, this is, these are whales that are at least, you know, they're, the individuals are probably 40, 50 years. What's amazing about this is 40 years ago, there was the last whaling going on there. And there still is a uh, the little asterisk there. There still is some whaling. But in this case, um, you know, this whale was seen up in Newfoundland uh, back in 1975. And then let's see, it's most recent sighting is uh, 2017, right? So, um, you know, reasonable chance of the whale still being out there. Um, let's see, what was the other part of that question? Oh, can you tell how old they are? That's, that's, that's hard, you know, but I mean, but that's when then where the database comes in, you submit the photo, we can tell you everything we know about that whale and we're starting more and more to kind of dig into the archives. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully we'll get some of, there are some fluke photos from back in the 50s 
mostly this started in the 70s. So that 1975 is like right at the beginning of people actually realizing that this could, could even work. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Really, really cool. So Christine, uh, well, not a question, but she says, actually, I just checked and found out that my well was first sighted in February 28th, 2015. Um, yes. And the sighting she had submitted in her earlier question that she was talking about was in March of 2020. Uh, nice. So she just wanted to share this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love it. Sweet. Awesome. Finding whales during the talk is amazing. <laughs> love it. Love Good it. Yeah. You. So Emma says, since this project is citizen science based and whale watching tours are sending photos in, how do you deal with the survey bias in which whale watchers are most likely going to locations of known high whale density when you're dealing with questions of distribution across a larger area? Really good question. You're well, be welcome to, uh, well, let's see, it's the International Whaling Commission Scientific Committee is, I would have been in Cambridge this week at meetings where we're talking, that's one of the pieces of, that we're talking about just that. What we call that is uh, effort bias or, or observer bias, right? Massively. Like if you look at, uh, let's see, I don't think I still have that. I'm just, I'm not going to pull up the map again. Monterey Bay, we have an enormous amount of effort in Monterey Bay, and yet the Farallon Islands, just uh, you know, 20 miles outside of San Francisco, not nearly as many sightings, but probably just as many whales out there. But Monterey Bay, very easy to cruise out there, small boat, mid-sized, large whale watching boat, easy to go, easy to get the photographs. Farallon Islands, it's like always foggy, always choppy, nasty, the first Many times I went out there well watching, I always got seasick, right? I mean, it is so not friendly and, and, you know, and so consequently we get way more images. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, there's one, one route through to good mark recapture statistics where if we're looking at whole populations, um, if we're looking at the whole population of, say, the, the whales that breed in California and, uh, and, and I'm sorry, that feed in California and breed in Mexico, it doesn't matter if we photograph them in Monterey Bay or off of the Farallons. Um, it's, we just know, okay, we saw them in California, we didn't see them in California. Um, one way we deal with that is just a, by, by virtue of massive effort. If we capture enough of the population, then we're good, right? We, we end up with 70% you know, of the population. Well, that's a much more powerful set of statistics than if we're trying to estimate the population with a sample of just 5% of the statistics. But we also have to be very aware that, um, that we may be missing whales that only feed offshore. And there certainly is that kind of site fidelity, right? There is certainly that kind of faithfulness you and I, we have restaurants that we like and restaurants that we would never go to, right? And, you know, I mean, personally, I'm never going to go to a Chinese fast food restaurant, but like a really high, really tasty local Mexican place, I love it. I'm there more frequently. So if you only were looking at that Chinese fast food restaurant, you would never see me. That's, that's, that's effort bias, right? We just have to account for that in the statistics. And, and to me, it's really important to recognize that citizen science has these biases. What's funny, though, is that there's oftentimes this perception that, well, structured science or researcher-led science doesn't have bias. And so what we're having a lot of fun with is combining data sets, research collaboration, plus citizen science. And what we end up with I mean, if you look in the data in Happy Well, you'll see um, uh, there's, there's the International Whaling Commission, IWC Power Cruises. Um, and I can't remember what the acronym POWER is for, but it's this Pacific Ocean um, Whale, P-O-W, I don't know what the E-R stands for, but there are these cruises that were out in the open ocean doing these surveys. Well, we have the data from that, so we can correlate, okay, how often did we, were we seeing those whales less on the breeding ground, say, than on the feeding ground? And that's one of the really neat ways because we see the same whales in the breeding grounds and on the feeding grounds, we can say, oh, is there part of the population that we're missing here, right? If there's sort of one set that we, you know, from this feeding ground, we only are finding 10% of them in our sample of the breeding ground. But from this other feeding ground, we're finding 90%, well, there's a problem. We must be missing a breeding ground. Um, so, yeah. That's incredible. 
really interesting. Um, so let's see what next one we have. Oh, I'm looking through this this list of Q and A's. I got to say, hey, Mark, Mark Cornish, uh, put a little line. Can I can I just go sure. for it? Go cool. for it. Yeah, well, just Mark uh, Cornish from the UK is a, a a frequent contributor. So thank you. Awesome. Um, and uh, Mark asks if the ability to use humpback body marks mark markings to find matches if flukes are not seen. Um, if 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 we can do that, so. Yes, we can, but not with an algorithm at this point. So a dorsal fin algorithm is going to be something really, really useful. I don't know how long it's going to take to develop that. There is, if you think about image recognition, we need two things. We need a, um, a we need distinct features and we need frequent or ready presentation, right? Let's say we want to identify each other by tattoos. Well, I can see you have a tattoo there but I can't identify you by that tattoo because I can't really see it, right? It's super distinct. But if you're never showing it to me, it's not much good for recognition. So, um, so body markings like spots along the belly of whales would be really fantastic, but we're not gonna regularly see that. And especially for computer use, we're not gonna see it in a way that's like, oh, there it is, always presented. And that's one thing that's so great about a fluke. I mean, they're just here, it's a nice reference dorsal fins, they don't have as much information in them, but you can always see it. So what I envision is that, you know, so the, um, we developed this algorithm in collaboration with Google. It was an algorithm development competition. It was really neat. We had 2,100 different teams submit solutions. Um, hopefully we will be doing another a kind of a version two. They want to call it happier whale. Like, oh, that sounds fun. Um, so where we're looking at multiple species from a dorsal point of view, uh, blue whales really good for identification because you have some pattern and the shape of the dorsal humpbacks. There is a lot of information in the dorsal fin, just not as much as in the fluke. So what I would envision is it's probably going to be good for recognition in and among local populations maybe not so much globally, right? But okay, you can say just search within, uh, you know, the humpback whales of Hervey Bay, Australia, for example, and look for matching dorsal fin. I imagine it'll be a year to two years before that's implemented, but hopefully, you know, computers make, make things possible. So, yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Awesome. Uh, let's see, let me go grab a couple more. We're running a little late on time. We'll do a couple more questions and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. So let's see. Do, 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 do. And just get a real quick one. Barbara says, uh, we are having a problem now in the Chesapeake Bay with ship strikes. Um, Noah has just started researching and tracking and I'm not sure what uh, can or will be done, but your story is giving me uh, hope for them. So. Yeah. Yeah, so Chesapeake Bay, man, it's the right whales. It just, it's, I mean, that's another species. So vaquita are going extinct because of entanglement. Right whales is a combination of ship strikes and entanglement, and it's terrifying. It's really, really rough to see. And again, that's an awareness thing. Um, and, you know, fortunately, because of, in the U.S., the Endangered Species Act, as long as we still have that law, really, really important law. Canada, likewise, has been uh, fairly engaged in marine protected actions, slowing down whales and I mean, slowing down whales, slowing down ships um, and such. Yeah, exactly. Hard to slow down a whale. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's getting engaged, learning about it, finding out about it, being in touch with, you know, these are things that are just off the radar of, of most politicians. But when people express they care about it, I mean, and that's a lot of what I'm here to do is like, if, you know, is, is, is getting to know our whales as individuals makes us care more about them. And it's one thing to know that, oh, whales are dying out there. It's quite a different thing to know that, hey, the whale that I saw that was a, just a spiritual experience for me that one beautiful day that whale's at risk and I want to see that whale. I want to know that my kids can go out and see that same whale. I mean, the question about how long whales can live, humpbacks, we figure, you know, 50, 60, probably, you know, a little longer. Bowhead whales can live 200 years. And we know this from, you know, from, from a couple different sources. And one of them was actually a whale that was found with a harpoon tip in it, a type of harpoon that hadn't been used since 
way back in the early 1800s or like 1850 or something like that. And then <laughs> it's like, there's a whale that's been around since, I mean, you know, the USA is not that old of a nation. I mean, this is the majority of the history of the country that I live in, right? Yeah. It's the this individual whales. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. So, that's yeah. Amazing. Incredible. But what I would like to ask, um, I think, well, should be asked is anonymous is, can we try to help an entangled whale by getting into the water? No, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. No, it's really tempting. And I, I will say that I, I, I did in one case and I was really close. I literally had a knife on a pole and I was so close. And I'm looking at the, actually the aunt of this whale, it was a sperm whale. And I'm looking at this aunt, the whale, who's looking at me with this, and I, you know, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing, but my look, the look to me was one of like major concern, like what are you doing approaching my knees like this? you know, and, and, and I just thought, you know what, I can't do it because I'm putting, you know, we are heroic. We're, it's very easy. I don't want to say easy, but it's like, it's, it's kind of a human nature thing to be like, yeah, I, I will do this. And it's awesome. And I, and I, and I applaud that motive. But the reality is that if somebody is killed responding to or injured, trying to help a whale, um, it will probably cause more damage than good because what happens then is, you know, the whole entanglement response world says, whoa, stop, you know, hold back because we can't have people getting killed in danger and trying to disentangle whale. And the other part of it is that usually what happens is when people cut away netting from a whale, for example, they usually won't cut away the critical part. And the critical part is like the constricting wrap, right? Where you have to get a knife like right in that right part and you're not gonna do it with, with makeshift gear. I mean, I've gone out on entanglement training events. I am not so trained and I would not take it on, but, uh, but I've gone out partially just to, to know the community a bit better and to, to see kind of what it takes. And usually it's like, what, would, what the approach is usually what you do is you take a, a knife that is detachable, but actually connected to a drag. So you can put the knife, the hook knife onto the rope in the right spot so that one cut can make all of it fall away. And, and but then you get back. So um, there was a very, very experienced disentanglement fellow um, who was killed it summer before last, I think, uh, in, uh, in Canadian waters by a right whale. And with right whales, it, it often happens that they're constricted and that the moment they're free, they'll just, bah, you know, just like react strongly. Humpbacks would tend to be a lot more docile. But this whale flipped its tail up, smashed down on the boat, and it killed the uh, responders. So it's super important that it's done in the right way. And as such, as hard as it is to have restraint, the best thing one can do is contact the disentanglement network, find out about it, and then stay with the whale, photograph the whale, stay at a respectful distance, don't chase the whale. What the responders see is that they usually get like one good approach. And if they can get the whale disentangled in that one good approach, it'll be good. So they'll go out and they'll, you know, learn everything they can. Nowadays, oftentimes they'll fly a drone over to see, okay, do we, where do we want to cut it? We need to cut the line right there, up, you know, right at the base of the tail. That's the line. If you cut the, you know, if you cut the rope away from below the tail, it doesn't do anything. It's the, it's the constricting wrap. So you got to get it quite right. So I, I say, no, have, have restraint. You know, the better part of heroism often is restraint. So yeah, very true. Yeah, we've done a, quite a few, a few workshops with Robin in different organizations, NOAA and stuff like that. And it's, it is a, the big thing. I mean, the, the amount of knowledge and experience and everything these guys go through to, to be able to, you know, get to that point to being a rescuer is mind blowing. Like it's the amount of um, work they go through and everything, training and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and all that. It, it's really incredible. It's not something, you know, normal people like us could be really, should be really even trying to do plus besides even just the danger and all that, which is obviously very dangerous and everything. Um, 
Awesome. So one last question. We got one from Antonio and then we'll uh, wrap up today. So uh, Antonio says, thanks, Ted, for the great presentation. Um, I had a chance a few years ago to witness orcas attacking a humpback newborn from a female humpback that we have seen wow. previous years um, nursing other calves at the same place. After that attack, she didn't come back to that place and it has been five years now. Do you know if female humpbacks tend to change locations where they nurse their calf when they go through a traumatic situation like this? And then just adding to it, because he added one extra one right after that, it is, by the way, she was also seen again January last year in Cabo. Um, and I know this thanks to your database. Oh, I love it. That's so cool. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, so I have noticed roughly maybe about 1% of whales, humpbacks, will make like major uh, relocations, you know, they used to be feeding in California and then they're feeding in Alaska or it's, you know, it's just kind of like these big dislocations, right? And why that's happening, we don't know. And that's, you know, unfortunately, it's really, I mean, even with like satellite tag data, okay, so you can see fine detail of the track, but you don't necessarily know why they're doing what they're doing and so on. Um, so, um, so why, I don't know, but it seems to me that a traumatic event could very well be responsible for, I mean, we think about that like us, like we, you know, these are creatures that have emotions and a event that traumatizes us, say we're on, we're on a beach and we get hit and get sucked into an undertow and almost drown and barely get back to shore. We're probably not going to be like, oh, that's my favorite beach. I love to sunbathe there. It's like, mm, now nah, let's, let's, let's just go down the way. Let's just not go back to that spot. I think that is as good an explanation as any that we have. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting observation that the whale was seen repeatedly and then there was a traumatic event and then not seen again in that area. It'd be, I mean, I'd love it if we, Cabo, Cabo is neat because you see lots of whales there, but it also, you can't tell where the whale's coming from or going to, because it's just like, it's like, Cabo to me feels like LAX airport, right? You don't know if that person's just flying, you know, up to the Bay Area or all the way to Tokyo. Um, and that's totally the reality with the humpbacks in, in Cabo is that those whales might be just going up to Southern California or it might be going to Russia. So, you know, it'd be neat to see, well, does that whale then find a new place and then, and then consistently show up in that new destination? Um, Gosh, I mean, I'm hoping that we can answer that kind of question over the course of the lifespan of this effort. Yeah, it's neat. Really, really neat stuff. Awesome. Really, really great question. So we'll finish with one more, one last question from Myrtle, and then we'll wrap it up for today. The other questions or anything like that, guys, we can push on to social media on Dive Ninjas, Happy Well, one or the other, and everything like that. We give Ted, you're cool with it. We can tag you in it or anything like that oh, to answer yeah. some questions online and all that. So Myrtle says, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Um, I'm curious, uh, where do you see the, the highest sightings of humpback whales? What part of the world? Oh, um, highest sightings. Well, there's, I couldn't say one place. There's lots of different places where um, I, okay, so off the top of my head, I'm going to name the, the, the places where both there's lots of individuals and they're accessible. Um, Cabo. Monterey Bay, Hervey Bay, Australia, um, Stellwagen Bank, uh, New England, um, inside passages like, gosh, just about anywhere in Southeast Alaska, out of Juneau, uh, Sitka, um, Glacier Bay, well, the numbers actually went down a bit, but there's still quite a few there, um, Ketchmack Bay, lots of different places, Prince William Sound in Alaska, um, uh, Australia, West Coast Australia, there's not so many great spots, but along the East Coast, there's now quite a few places you can see them. Antarctica is my personal favorite. Um, it's hard to get to, but oh my God, the experiences are stunning. Icebergs and whales. Um, South Africa out of, um, gosh, uh, kind of, there's a couple different spots. Oh, off the top of my head. Um, let's see, where else? Um, I'm sure I'm missing, mass, you know, uh, Samana Bay in, uh, in, in uh, the Dominican Republic, 
Tonga is certainly a great place to whale watch. I'm, 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 I'm hesitant about recommending the in-water stuff because the reasons we mentioned. Um, yeah, there, there's the, the fun thing about humpbacks is that they're really, really cosmopolitan. I mean, around the world, um, even, you know, Bermuda has great humpback whale watching and, uh, and, and yeah, so on and so on and so on. It's, there's, but it's not just humpbacks. I mean, place like the Azores, you can see multiple different species in the day. Monterey Bay is great for that too. You see, you know, smaller dolphins. You see, we get um, up and down in the inside the Gulf of California, blue whales, fin whales. There's the great thing about whale watching is you just never have the same experience twice. It's, it's, uh, it's good for the, the individual with a short attention span. It's a lot of diversity. So. Uh, it really is. It's incredible. And for me, that's one of the reasons I, I love living here in Cabo and Baja and everything. Just you get so many different whales and cetaceans coming through the area. Dolphins, whales, I mean, orcas, all sorts. That it's just it's incredible. I mean, every day on the ocean's a surprise. You know. Yeah. It's super nice. awesome. So thank awesome, you. Ted. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sorry yeah. for taking a little more time than we uh, planned for, okay. but thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody that's been uh, joined us today and everything like that. Tomorrow we're back with Rick from um, uh, the Marine Rescue Center, uh, Museum de Baena in uh, La Paz. Um, and uh, we'll also today you'll start seeing the next week's chats going online and all that stuff. So check out the schedule and everything. Make sure to follow us on social media. Uh, make sure to go check out uh, Ted's website, happywell.com. I put it into the chat and everything like that if anyone wants to grab it. Ted, thank you so much again. It's been awesome. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Awesome. Really delightful to uh, be here. I thought I'd go through some of the uh, Q and A, some of the ocean open questions, and answer them in text. And uh, yeah, uh, please, I'll, I'll I'll join as a as a participant in the coming days. So yeah, awesome. Keep, Thanks so much. Keep healthy, healthy, everyone. So if you want to answer some of those questions in text, guys, if you want to wait a minute, he'll throw some of them in there, and I'll leave the the meeting open. I'm just gonna close it, close out the uh, recording, and all that stuff for it. Cool. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Ted, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, brother. Take care, and we'll uh, talk to you later. Cheers. Take Cheers. care. Stay healthy. Push.